in week two of our series called Boundaries, and we're, we're focusing on the writings of James, who is the uh, brother of Jesus. James actually was the bishop of the Jerusalem church in early Christendom, and he's got a lot to say about issues that affect us and our morality and our character and a lot of things. Why is he talking about that? Because he was faced with those very issues in the life of the early church, not just in Jerusalem, but in all the early Christian churches that were embarking. And James was trying to call attention through this letter to basically wake Christians up and to recall them to the teachings, the life, and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so today we're, we're in week two of Boundaries, and we're gonna talk about taming the tongue. And uh, I know that's a, a, an interesting subject, and James has a lot to say about that. And I think that uh, by the end of today, I think it's gonna call into perspective for a lot of us uh, where we're at in our Christian walk and, and what can we do to, to reconcile some things maybe where we're not calibrated properly right now. But uh, that's where we're, gonna, where we're gonna head today. Uh, I wanna welcome those that are live streaming with us. Again, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, go ahead and make sure that you're getting word out in your neighborhood so that we can reach even more people in uh, the proclamation of God's word and bringing them a part of St. Paul. And thank you for your gifts and your offerings that you send in to uh, maintain our ministries here at the church, but also to, to keep us in the ability to live stream. Your gifts are very important, and thank you for all that you do. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about a story. There's a, there's a story about a, a, a young man who was actually a grocery clerk, and uh, he was working in the produce department, and a lady came and talked to him, and she asked the question. She said, excuse me, young man, is it possible for me to buy a half a head of lettuce? And the clerk was caught off guard a little bit. He thought, well, I don't know about that. So he said, let me go talk to my boss. So he walks off to talk to the grocery manager. Unbeknownst to him, she's following right behind him, right? So he gets to his grocery manager. He says, boss, you're never gonna believe this. He said, there's some lady out there. She's so cheap. She wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. And the woman's standing right there. And as he turns around, she's looking at him with her eyes real big. And he said, and this beautiful lady right here, she wants to buy the other half. You see, our, our words say a lot, don't they? In fact, um, I think it's, it's very uh, reasonable to say that our words have power. The words that we share have the power to build up, have the power to um, uh, grace somebody, to bring mercy to their lives, but, uh, but the words that we share also have the ability to tear lives down and to not be so positive as, as we would hope that we would. And, and where we get into that with words is, it's not just the spoken word, but it's the written word. You know, today we're in a high-tech world, aren't we? And that high-tech world means that we can send emails and, and post things on our Facebook, Twitters, or tweet in all the kind of things that we wanna do and, and all the different kind of electronic accounts. And before we even know it, our words get away from us. It wasn't long ago that uh, one of my favorite uh, comedians, Steve Martin, had to backtrack a little bit of his words because something that he tweeted out to a bunch of people um, at last minute that he was thinking didn't come out the way that he said he really felt, but it, but it just kind of went out there. And we've gotta be careful because whether we post it on Facebook, whether we send an email, whether we send an anonymous letter, or whether we say it in our, in our speech, our words have power. And James says that we really need to be aware of that and we need to guard our tongues and make sure that the words that we share are the words in covenant with Jesus Christ. Now, I, I want you to imagine for a second, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a coffee nut and I uh, go out and, and have coffee and meet people for coffee all the time. So I want you to think about maybe you're at a coffee shop and you've gotten yourself a scone or something and you've ordered your favorite beverage and you see a table in the back of the room and you go there and you sit down and you're just kind of letting the day roll off like, whoo, letting the day go. Everybody do that. Whoo, yeah, lovely. You guys ought to be in the praise band. You know, praise choir. We're gonna take we're gonna take some uh, auditions for that. But uh, you're just kind of sitting there, and you're just kind of enjoying the quietness, and you're enjoying your space. And then all of a sudden, you see one of your friends, and they come over, and they they catch eyes with you, and they have their beverage, and they sit down right across from you at the small table where you are, and you're just sitting there. And all of a sudden, after you get the quick pleasantries done, you start talking about somebody that you both know. And, and, and you get to a point where whatever it is that you're saying about the person that you both know, obviously it's not anything good because your voice goes from the normal level that we speak to a very soft whisper. And you start talking very quietly. And people start turning their heads and they start looking at you, putting their iPads down, and, and they think maybe you're giving some uncondensed version of Fifty Shades of Grey a review or something. And they're not sure what you're talking about, but you're finding yourself in that very uncomfortable place. Now, I want, I want you to think a little bit more about, you know, Jesus comes and joins you at the table. Now you're gonna recognize it's him because you know he wears the blue sash and he sits down and he's sitting here with you and, and Jesus is listening in on your conversations. 
And, and as you're kind of sitting there, you're, you're getting a little bit um, nervous because you're thinking like, man, did I, did I say a prayer before I ate my scone? Um, you know, did I, did I bless the fact that I was gonna drink my uh, coffee or something like that? Did, and, 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 and you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable, so you offer a little prayer out loud so Jesus can hear that you know how to pray. You get that out of the way. And he's sitting there and he's looking right at you and you're really not sure. And he's asking you some questions. What were you talking about? Who was that that you were talking about? And you're going like, oh no, he heard. Like, Jesus didn't know. And then you get to a point where he looks at you and he says, I wanna ask you a question. How real is our relationship? And, and you're looking at him, you're saying, well, well, I love you, Jesus. But he says, no, no, how real is our relationship? Because if you and I have a real relationship together, then you're gonna have a real relationship with, with other people, and especially those people that you're talking badly about. And he kind of puts it to the test. And he hits us kind of right between the eyes with those questions, and he gets us to that point, and he says, I wanna know right now how real is our relationship, and what does that relationship mean? Because the way you're talking about that person that you're talking about to this other person who's sitting at your table doesn't make me feel very proud that you're my follower. And we kind of get there, and we feel kind of the, the, the huge uh, weight of that matter. If you've ever been in that situation, whether you've been someone who's been talking about someone else or, or, or heaven forbid, you're the one who's been the, the banter of everybody else's talk, you realize that words have power, that words can, can lift up, they can bless, they can edify, they can encourage, but more often the words that we say about one another, they just chip us right at the, right at the knees and we fall apart and, and they're hurtful and they're not very, very pleasant things to have happen, are they? And that's right where the Lord has us. And, and James brings us to that point, and, and he says that, that we've, got to, we've got to reconcile this relationship. You see, whether you've been a Christian since childhood or, or, or maybe you're a recent Christian, maybe you're a recent convert, it's the character of Christ that calls you into that relationship, isn't it? It's that character of Christ, and when we get to that character, and as we draw in, as we draw close to the Lord, we begin to realize that that is what we want to be like. That is the person that we want to be. And we begin to connect through that to, into that relationship. And every word that we share, publicly, privately, unsigned letters, emails, Facebook posts, tweets, whatever the case is, all the words that we share, you and I must conclude one thing today. We own those words and we must take responsibility for every word that we share, publicly and privately. And those words that we share has a lot to say about our, about our character. Now, if you've memorized 100,000 verses in the Bible, and I had one guy at a couple of churches go say to me, I've memorized 100,000 verses in the Bible. Wow, that's pretty impressive. I don't think I've memorized 100,000 verses in the Bible. But, but he was very quick to say, he's memorized 100,000 verses of the Bible. That's a great feat. So if you've memorized 100,000 verses of the Bible, if you've done every Beth Moore study or every uh, Philip Yancey story or, or a study or Leonard Sweet or, or whoever the case is, whatever those studies, if you've done all of those studies, you know what? That's a great thing. If you even stay awake during my sermons, that's an okay thing too. But if the words that we share don't reflect what we say that we have come to believe, then our religion is worthless. James hits us right between the eyes with this one. He says if we can't speak kindly about one another, if we can't share words of truth that help build up uh, others, and, and Paul falls right in line with that in his letter to the uh, church in Ephesus, James says if we can't talk well about people in our own Christian community, then the, then the religion that we have is worthless. And if the words that we say cannot keep in balance the truth and the character of Jesus Christ in our lives as we reflect it to others who know that we're believers, he says, then your religion is worthless. Now listen what he says in, in chapter three here. He said, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person. Now, notice he doesn't say it just corrupts a little bit. He said it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course, not just part, but the whole course of the person's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Go down to verse nine and 10. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have made God, who've been made in God's likeness, and out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be, sisters included, this 
should not be. I love what he says. Is It's kind of like earlier the double-minded man that we saw in chapter one, but now he says it's the double-minded speaking person, that we use our words to, to give praise and glory to God, and then we use those same words to just cut each other down and destroy each other. And it's almost how can you have that kind of thing coming from the same mouth? And James says, this should not be. Our, our mouths get us into a lot of trouble. I've been there, I understand. It's not things that I've been proud of and I've worked real hard through many years of my life to try to reconcile those things, to, to find the, the courage in myself and, and more importantly to find the strength from God in myself to go and to reconcile that and to be set free of that bondage, of that, of that anchor, that anvil that just holds you down in the midst when you speak those words of anger and hurt and, and, and whatever it is to destroy and to bend and to, and to uh, uh, just be irresponsible in what we do. And James says, it should not be so, my brothers and sisters. You see, our, our tongues and our mouths really say a lot about us, don't they? In fact, if you were to analyze your words of speech, what you talk about is what's on your mind. The things that you say is what's in your heart. The things that you speak about and the conversations that you have says more about your future than it does your present day. And it speaks in volumes of where you see your life headed. And that's the challenge and that is the strength of the words that we have. James in chapter three, he talks about that there's a couple of different ways of speech that we must avoid uh, following. And he said the first one is gossip or talking behind someone's back or badly about someone. And he says the second piece of speech that we need to avoid is, is coming into that self-righteous nature where we say that, that I am much more righteous than you and therefore what I say, I speak on behalf of God and God does not like that and puts that person down. And James says those are two places of speech that no matter where you are in your spiritual walk, you want to stay as far away from both of those pieces, but yet we're drawn to it. We find ourselves in that mode so often. And James says we need to move around from that. You know, what he's talking about here is when he says that, that we need to manage our mouths, when he says that we need to be careful with the words that we say, going back to that situation of, of visualizing Jesus being there with us, and he says, what, let's define this relationship that's between us. If you really are my disciple, if you really are the person who is called by me to, to be in covenant with one another, are you demonstrating that to the world? And James says, as we look at this, it's critical. It's critical for us to be exhibiting outwardly the person that we really are inwardly. So he's using Jewish wisdom heritage here, and he says that the words that we speak hold premium value. And more importantly, Jewish wisdom would say, tradition would say, that your word is your character. Your word is who you are. And that's how they began to distinguish in the ancient world how, who and what they believed in and, and who they believed and who they chose to follow based upon the words that they spoke and the challenges that come from that. You see, when we gossip, when we spread harmful stories or, or we speak badly about another, especially behind their back, we're breaking God's code of ethics. We're breaking his code of ethics because there is nothing in the character of God that justifies that behavior. So we're breaking God's code of ethics. We've placed the focus upon ourselves, and we've removed our place from the kingdom's purpose because now all of a sudden when we're talking badly about someone, when we're sensationalizing stories that we know about someone else, when we are just not being truthful about what we're saying or we're rallying people behind for our cause behind the scenes, um, and, and, and when we do those kinds of things, what we're really doing is we're, we're coming forth in a way in which we are portraying ourselves our self-interests. And that's why I say that we're out of the kingdom's purpose. In fact, when we focus on our self-interests, when we talk about people, when we make fun of them, when we do the things that we do, when we start stories about them to get people all upset and excited and sensationalize things, we're not doing the work of God, folks. Guess whose work we're doing? We're doing the work of the devil. And the devil is the one who divides the body of Christ. He divides marriages, he divides friendships, he divides work partners, he divides churches because of the words that we speak and the things in which we call into question from that. But here's something that we, we have a tendency to forget. 
We might justify in our mind, well, I can say that about, um, if there's a Mary Sue in the room or watching, I'm not picking on you, I'm just, that's just the name that, that came up here. If, if Mary Sue, I, you know, I take it on that I don't like what Mary Sue's doing, or I don't, more importantly, I don't agree with what Mary Sue's doing, so I wanna start telling all my friends that we need to be in disagreement with Mary Sue, and we need to do everything that we can to make Mary Sue's life not very happy right now. James says, stop that that's the devil's work. Even if you feel solely committed by that, the minute you start trying to tear that person down, the minute you try to mislead others into doing actions because it's your agenda versus maybe what God is seeking, and, and we put ourselves out there, James says, stop. That is not the kingdom's purpose. So why is it that we speak badly about one another? It's because of our tongue. In fact, what we've got, what we need to realize is that when we talk badly about one another, when we talk down, when we spread uh, stories and say, sensationalize things, when we build coalitions behind the scenes, when we send the anonymous letters, when we do the emails that, that go out to blast uh, to a bunch of people or phone messages that do that, you don't know who sent it. Has that ever happened? It happens a lot to people, doesn't it? When we do those kind of things, here's what we need to remind ourselves. We're actually doing it against God. Now, Pastor, why, why are you saying that we're doing it against God? We're not doing it against God. We're doing it against that person that I have the vendetta or the disagreement with or the person that I don't like or, or this or that. No, you're doing it against God, and here's why. Because the Genesis story tells us that we were created in God's image. So therefore, if we were attacking somebody with our words, we're attacking the image of God. And we're attacking God. And James says we have to stop that. James says that's not a part of the character. That's not a part of the walk of Christ. That is not part of, of who we're to be. You know, if, if, if others were listening to your conversations, if others were listening to what you laugh at, uh, what, what would you say, what, what you would say about someone else, the conclusions um, that, that you bring about them? If people were listening to those inward speeches, those inward conversations, those inward things, those inward lives that you have, what would they think about God? especially because if they know you're a follower of Christ. What would they say about the God that you worship, the God that you serve? Would they begin to think about, that's not the God that, that you tell me is in the scripture, is that capital G God or is that little g God? And the challenge that will come with that is a, is a great challenge and it brings about um, um, an, an unsettledness within our own lives and within the body of Christ. Now look, I, I get it. It, it it's, it's hard to watch our words all the time. I get that. I struggle with that too. And by the grace of God, uh, corrective action happens. And I'm sure that that happens in your life. And I believe that, that, that nobody's perfect. But, but the question is, are we even aware that when we do those things that there's something wrong with it? That's the character issue. If we don't, if the character button doesn't go off, if the light doesn't start flashing, then what we're doing is wrong, then we've got to really look, when Jesus asked that question, what kind of relationship are we in? Well, maybe we're not in any. Because we can't even see the light go off that there's a problem that's brewing. The challenges that come before us and the things that's there. You know, God is, is more um, committed to the pursuit of, of, of our character than anything else. In fact, you know, God wants his words to be the words that come out of our mouth. He wants his ways to be the ways in which we engage the world. He wants our lives to reflect his kingdom's purpose. Would you agree with me on that? Absolutely he does. And as we move into that, the question then becomes, how do we move from the, away from the self-centeredness of the challenges and the chinks and the character armor that we have, and how do we live into the character of Jesus Christ? And that's where James has us here. He says, when, when we engage in harmful speech about others, we're in essence saying to God, you can have everything in my life, but this, this thing called my mouth, my tongue, my words, you can have everything. You can have my money, you can have my service, you can have everything, but you can't have the words that I speak. Let me tell you, I, you know, like you, I, I read the Bible and, and I look at Scripture and I, and I begin to look at the things that are there and, and nowhere in Scripture do I read where it says God only wants pieces of us. It, it's an all or nothing deal, isn't it? And God says that, that, that I don't want pieces, I want all of you because the only way I'm gonna be able to change and transform and reform your character is for you to give me everything that there is about you. So we gotta go back to that place where, where, where we originally said yes to God, when we gave our life to Christ. And we've got to get to that point where at that very moment we realized that everything that there was about our life, 
that we were excited to give that to God. And we need to learn how to give our speech. We need to learn how to give our words. We need to learn how to give our life uh, to Christ. Here's a couple of things that we need to remember, especially when it comes to uh, gossip or talking bad about people. The person who speaks harshly about others to you also gossips to others about you. That's the first thing. Gossip always contributes to a problem and never to a solution. It always distorts and exaggerates and it's a never reliable source of truth. That's why we're attracted to it. Gossip off, often masquerades as concern for others. Maybe you've had this happen where, where someone disguises their gossip. You know, one person said to me one time years ago, well, Christians don't gossip, we just share. You know, and, and so they, they find you and they're, they're like, you know, I'm really concerned about so-and-so and, and, and I have no one else that I can talk to, but let me tell you what they're doing, okay? At other times, the gossiper will seek you out as, as their confidant to unload their heavy heart about the concern. I'm very troubled and I don't know who else to talk to about this situation. In reality, the gossip is not sincerely concerned about solving the problem. <clears throat> the gossip is only in, t in talking about the problem, stirring it up, the chief pot stir. Now listen to what Proverbs 16, 28 says. A perverse man or woman stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. Now folks, you know, oftentimes we think about gossip is that we're, that we're uh, sensationalizing things, but when we start talking about somebody behind their back and they have no idea we're talking about it, when we build those coalitions and those things that we find ourselves so often doing, that's gossip. And the proverb says, a perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. Here's the last one. Gossip thrives on, on negative. Uh, the, the, con the controversial, the sensational, and any person who is generally concerned about solving a problem will go privately to the person that they're concerned about. They'll go privately to them, sit down and say, I'm concerned about this in your life. I love you. What can I do to help get you back on the path of God? Now, would we not agree that that's kind of the, the right way to do that? But here, here's kind of what it looks like in life. Did you, did you know that what, what's going on over there? I don't agree with that. And, and, and what do you think about that? Well, did you know that they also blah, 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 blah? You know, it's sensationalized. It's doing all those things. We must have the courage. We must have the vulnerability. We must love one another in Christ enough to be able to go to the person that we're in disagreement with, that we're uh, concerned about, that we don't like, that we're mad at or whatever, we must have the courage, the strength, and the authenticity to go to them directly and sit down and say, can we talk? And let me tell you what Scripture says. Scripture says when we do that, when we act like grown-up Christians, when we act like people of Jesus Christ, when we act like disciples, something called restoration always occurs. And we're back together in the body of Christ. So, so as Christ followers, it's imperative that we work to reconcile our words and, and to make right our misguided heart. And, and, and I get that from uh, my own personal experience. After years of having people come into my office at every church that I've served as a pastor to sit down on a couch or sit in a chair to look at me and to have tears filled with their eyes and unload to me time and time and story after story again about how people were talking about them, how people were spreading rumors about them, how people were saying things that weren't even true, how things had gotten out of control, but more importantly, how they had been dehumanized because of the words of another, this is where I draw the line. I believe that when you and I love people to a point that when we realize that there are things happening that upset or hurt another person, that we will stand in the gap to stop that from happening anymore. When we love each other enough to get to that point to realize that we will not tolerate anything that will hurt anybody ever again, that's when we start living into the covenantal community and commitment of Jesus Christ. That's the difference in what it means when Jesus asks, are you part of my plan? He said this in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Our hearts are transformed through fellowship. Fellowship transforms into who we are in a life of character. Our character shows what is really in our heart and our heart demonstrates the current condition of the state of our spirituality. When we start hurting one another with our words, 
When we start making those kinds of things happen, there's something going on in here that isn't right. I don't care how much we want to justify what we're doing is correct or right or the, or the right thing to do or the righteous thing to do. If we're doing it, this isn't right. And that's what James says when, when we have that sign that we cannot withhold everything from God except our tongue. He says we must give it all to him. In his letter to the church in Ephesus, Paul concludes his explanation of this hard-heartedness he says, here's the antidote. Paul says that you did not come to know Christ this way. Here's what he's really saying. He's saying that you didn't come to Christ by saying no. You came to Christ by saying yes. When you became a Christian, you didn't enter into some kind of bargaining session with God. You didn't pick and choose which parts of the gospel that were relevant to you and to your situation. You didn't get a chance to say, I'll believe this or I'll abide by that or I'll live into this but not that. He said no. He said you accepted the whole thing. When you said yes to Jesus Christ, you, there were no pre-qualifiers. You accepted the whole thing. And when you become a Christian, the one word that captured your heart was the word yes. And the minute you said yes to Jesus Christ, your life changed. And Paul says, along with James would be in agreement with that, even with Jesus, he would say that at that point we realize that our words must be what God's words would be, that our thoughts would be what God's thoughts would be, that our ways must be what God's ways would be, that we are no longer ourselves, but we are a new creation. I know how tempting it can be. I know how tempting it can be to fall down that path, to join the club, to get on the bandwagon, to laugh at this or laugh at that. And then I also know from personal experience, and let me tell you, the church is one of the most egregious groups that does this. I can tell you from personal experience how hurtful and harmful words can be. So God says that we need to live into that. We must overcome the temptation of, of allowing our words to harm another, and it boils down to which rules are we going to play by? Which gospel are we going to live into? Whose discipleship shall we follow? Who will be our Lord? And what God, capital G or little g, will we serve? There's only one way to reconcile all this. We've got to return to that day that we accepted Christ. We've got to remember what it meant to give our life unconditionally, to say Christ is Lord, Christ is King, he is master of my life. And the minute we get back to that, we begin to realize and recalibrate what our life really should be. And we remind ourselves the importance of the word yes. And we begin to see that those places, especially our mouths, where we have the off limits uh, placard hanging up, God, you can have everything but my mouth, everything but my words, everything but whatever, with, with what I have to say, we realize that God's gonna start attacking those things first. That's what he's gonna go after first. Because the one thing that stands in your way of coming alongside of him is the first thing on his agenda. If it's your money, he's gonna, he's gonna reconcile that. If it's your relationships, he's gonna reconcile that. If it's your words, he's gonna reconcile that. Whatever it is that is standing in your way of giving yourself fully to him, he's gonna, he's gonna come and reconcile that first. And then and only then will we find the answer to the question. When Jesus sat down with us at the coffee shop and he said, we need to define this relationship. What's it gonna be when we give everything over to God and we mind our mouths? We will realize that at that point, our life will move in the right direction. The boundary is to give your mouth back to God.